for coming. Uh, if there is anyone else who would like to do an introduction, please uh, share in the in the chat. Uh, I'm going to be passing on to, to Max Punk, who I'm very excited to have here today. Uh, Max is a, an overnight celebrity in the venture building world. Uh, he did some really fantastic research and he's been gathering some <laughs> extraordinary momentum. Uh, so I very much appreciate your content, very much appreciate the insights and your contributions to essentially demystify this model that is has been a little bit ignored uh, for a long time, but gathering momentum in the shadows and it feels that the time has come. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Max, for joining us and sharing a little bit more about venture builders and the different ways that they change some of the traditional entrepreneurship game. Uh, Max, over to you. Hey, thank, thank you very much. Um, let me start with uh, just explaining what a startup studio is. It is an, an organization which launches companies simultaneously, takes uh, some equity there, usually from 20 to 40 percent, sometimes less, sometimes more. Um, uh, partnering with entrepreneurs, so actually, and uh, the difference from other models like accelerators and incubators and VCs is that the team of the studio works together with entrepreneurs for some period of time, usually longer than uh, accelerators, for example, for one and a half year, you know, from one to two years, usually. And uh, uh, they go through different stages from ideation uh, to launching a company and uh, uh, getting revenue and fundraising. And usually after some period of time or after some milestones like external fundraising, a company becomes independent. And because a uh, venture studio has a uh, big uh, influence on the company, so they usually have a team of maybe from five to 30 people in uh, who works uh, on, this, uh, on this company together with entrepreneurs, they launch like maybe uh, two companies a year, four companies a year, 10 companies a year. So this is the reason uh, why they have more uh, equity than than just uh, accelerators or VCs, usually. This is a bit about me. So I am created three companies, uh, bootstrap profitable uh, companies, um, experimented with many ideas, uh, at least 30. Uh, and uh, I've always had an idea that sometimes I will have a team which will test many ideas and launch some companies uh, out of those ideas. But when I met a venture studio model, I understood that it is even better because you are not only have employees in your team, but you have some founder mentality people who who can uh, work uh, and, and feel that this business is there. Uh, this company is there. Um, I've published, so I, I did a big research, published it. It went viral uh, on LinkedIn and uh, um so and, and and since this uh i uh, recorded many video podcast interviews with studio founders uh then uh we we held the conference online conference for venture studios uh and in one week we also have a conference for, for venture studios um i'm lo i'm in the process of launching a venture studio family community, paid community where studios share their numbers, their uh, documents and playbooks, and also their investors. Um, yeah, this is like uh, sh showing that some great people and studios shared my report. Uh, the name or the title of the report is Numbers of Startup Studios, Excitement and Criticism of Venture Studios. There was, a, yeah, actually I, I want to, to tell the story. So I went on one uh, uh, VC party um, and uh, there were a lot of people in venture capital and one of them uh, said something like, when, when he heard that I'm doing uh, some work or research on, on Startup Studio, he asked me, do you know what is the common refrain uh, or what is the common phrase of studio founders? 
I said no. What is it? And he said there was five million dollars here just a moment ago. Uh, where did it go? So like, uh, meaning that uh, it's very easy to lose money doing a venture studio because you uh, you pay to your team. You also invest in your companies, and it's very easy to to lose this money. Um, and then I asked. Uh, I I said okay, great. And then he continues and, and says. Do you know uh, how, how, how he asked it? Something like uh, to understand what a startup studio is and what it typically does, one should refer to Wikipedia and find the uh, and find the uh, article about Alms House. Do you know what is an Alms, Alms House? I said no. What, what is it? And he said no. Go to Wikipedia and check. So I went to Wikipedia and it's something like. An Alms House uh, was charitable housing providing to people during the Middle Ages. They were targeted at the poor of a locality, widows, and uh, at elderly people who could not lo longer pay rent and are generally maintained by charity. So I was, uh, uh, how to say, uh, so it, it was ideal ideal uh, moment to start uh, conversation with him because like uh, you feel that there is there is a lot of skepticism and criticism that venture studios are actually some places maintained by charity and doing some charitable work to to help people who are not able to to start companies. So this were uh, starting. And actually, uh, there are many problems that studios have. Uh, and I will go through uh, through all of them, and then I will, will cover also why why is this model is still very interesting and why it shows some great statistics and, and returns for investors. So the first problem is it's very hard to attract experienced co-founders to startups, especially if a studio takes 35, 50%, 75% of equity. So you cannot attract uh, founders with previous exits. But... Uh, and if you will ask many studios, they will say that it is the number one problem. So the quality of founders. Um, what is, but some studios, they, I, uh, they are able to attract second time founders. Sometimes it's even like uh, most founders can be with previous exits. If a studio can show enough value and what is uh, the ultimate value for many founders, it is like with the studio, uh, co-founder will earn more money than without and uh, this is a model of purpose-built ventures um, a studio in the US uh, who did some like uh, research and their model financial model on like how an entrepreneur join in a studio uh, which takes 20% of equity because of skipping some rounds of financing meaning that the studio finance uh, the startup and because uh, it has a much more uh, likelihood of success in creating a big company, so uh, an entrepreneur can end up with uh, with better uh, earnings partnering with a the studio. Then another problem is like you have to to have at least one two million dollars to start a studio uh, or five to ten million. Uh, usually in the US, it's more than like five to 10 million and in Europe or other other uh, regions, it, it might be one, two million to cover first two years of operations, even maybe not investing in, in the startups. And uh, yeah, here was a uh, study by uh, GSSN that um, the annual budget for a startup studio is 1.36 million and the average is even higher. Um, then broken cap table, if a studio takes a uh, big uh, chunk of equity, uh, VCs are not ready. It, uh, this can be a red flag for them to invest in the startups. So for example, if a studio have 50% of equity or even 35, I think it's already very difficult to, to convince investors. So you have to think, Either you can invest a studio, invest a st in startup until the exit, or you create some not uh, capital uh, capital needed startups that uh, don't need funding from from VCs, 
or you have such a great track record that you can you can show to your investors that uh, look we we have fifty percent of equity and yes it's more than usual uh, when a company is created by uh, just entrepreneurs uh, and they get financing from accelerators uh, or VCs but uh, look we have uh, ten per ten x chances uh, for this company to become a unicorn for example or uh, there is one studio actually hexa they say something like uh, with us it's 1000 x more chances to create a unicorn because they created three unicorns out of about 40 40 companies launched so this is a challenge uh why do they take more percentage because they are actually like an institutional co-founder a phrase by Al Perselen. Uh, so the uh, co-founder role where they have a team working hands-on on marketing, development, uh, and, and also investing in startups. This is the reason why they take a larger percent of equity. And you should uh, like educate your future investors that, okay, maybe we'll take more equity than usual, but we also uh we also have a lot of resources and uh, support for this company so we are actually co-founders not just like uh accelerators incubators with supporting role then it's challenging to attract funding to a studio because uh investors know how to invest in startups and investors know how to invest in um, funds uh, as limited partners but studios have difficult structures sometimes. Sometimes it's uh, just you know, like a holding company where investors buy uh, buy shares. And the question uh, during the start uh, the start of the studio is how to understand the valuation of the studio, uh, how to define it, uh, or it might be like a dual entity model when there is a holding company and also a fund. Uh, and uh, it is quite difficult to start with with this dual entity model. So uh, usually you have to rely on your existing relationships to founders, uh, to investors, uh, and this can be a source of money. And of course, bootstrapping your studio uh, is also a great source of uh, money uh, because you you show to your future investors that you have skin in the game. And uh, and you don't need to convince uh, investors that uh, this this model is great. Uh, the difficulty is exponential. I I heard of uh, one uh, founder of a studio who said that uh, when you launch a normal company, it is difficult and they are usually unprofitable. When you launch a startup. Uh, it's very risky and even more difficult because you are doing something new on the market. And when you launch a startup studio, it is like you have many things, may, many startups, and everywhere something is going wrong uh, because uh, like a lot of unpredictable things, markets, and uh, and customers. So uh, it's difficult to operate. But studios usually they uh, create their own playbooks how to create companies in, in an effective way. Um, there is no much data which can be very convincing for many investors that uh, studios uh, that investing in studios or their startups is much more uh, efficient than in usual startups. Of course, there is some data, but there are some uh, some questions and I think that there should be more independent uh, studies on this topic to 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 answer it clearly. Not everyone succeeds, even such big accelerators uh, and VC firms like 500 startups uh, of or tech stars, they claimed that they are launching their studios in 2016 and 2019, but uh, now, uh, now they are not operating, and also, uh, um, so if you if you look at uh, some like the map of studios worldwide or at the venture studio index database, 
uh, with 400 studios inside. So uh, I, I heard from Matthew Barris that like two third are inactive, uh, inactive studios. So like they tried for several years, but finally they didn't succeed. And uh, yeah, it's a difficult model. And uh, sometimes a success of a startup can kill a studio. For example, uh, Max Levchin, uh, a previous PayPal co-founder, uh, launched a company Affirm in fintech, but it was a part of his venture studio and uh, HVF. And uh, in, in two or three years of the studio, this company started a firm to started to work very well, and so he became a CEO of this company and focused completely uh, completely on developing this company. So, and I know several examples which are similar to this. At the same time, there are many advantages. So I started with many criticism and problems, and uh, many studios really struggle with those uh, with those previous problems. But there are some ways to cope with them. And uh, some studios, they show consistently greater IRR, uh, internal rate of return for investors. Um, and uh, yeah, I will cover now some benefits. So first is speed. Uh, because you have an assembly line, you can compare it like to a factory uh, when uh, like earlier manual la labor was less efficient, hundreds of times less efficient than factories and manufacturing. Um, and uh, because a studio has uh, some money and invests in its companies, of course they get faster traction and faster uh, and faster exits also. So this is a small part of my study where I took uh, the Venture Studio Index database with 1,100 startups of the studios. And uh, to those startups uh, where on Crunchbase, uh, there was data on uh, how in what years they, they were founded, in what years they had exits uh, and uh, got funding. So I compared it to some benchmarks uh, of usual startups. And it shows that startups created in studios usually get to seed funding to series A, B, C from 41% to 51% faster and to uh, exits, acquisition or IPO about 31, 33% faster than usual startups. Um, accumulating of industry expertise and experience is uh, one of the uh, reasons why this model is effective. I can give one example I, a studio i like it is oss ventures from france they uh, create b2b SaaS for factories i interviewed uh, the founder in and uh, first he had previous exits in this field b2b SaaS for manufacturing series b exit second uh, they visited factories for more than eight Hundred times or something, 860 times they visited different factories, collected hundreds of pain points. So when founders join the uh, startup studio, they give them base. These are our partners. These are our more than 1,000 customers in uh, uh, different factories uh, in Europe, uh, the US. Uh, and uh, because they can uh, really understand this uh, niche very well they are able to attract great founders so they get 8,000 applications from founders each year and they uh, they launch five companies with 10 entrepreneurs uh, four companies uh, will be successful out of those five and uh, what's interesting that out of the founders they attract 60% had previous exits and uh, this means that like they take 25% of equity in, in startups. They uh, invest uh, 500K euro per company. 
and the traction of the startup studio is is very fast so you can uh, you, you can check that in four years they reached uh, 24 million ARR uh, of the portfolio companies eight companies out of 15 uh, got series A funding and uh, uh, so this is an example of accumulated of industry expertise no one VC firm can uh, can be compared to this studio because no one VC firm visited factories more than 800 times so they visit factories now like twice a week or something savings and sharing of the studio team uh, as a startup you don't need many full-time uh, specialists and you can attract uh, agencies or freelancers but it might be not so effective as if you have a studio at cost or providing services for the equity and also giving you expertise. So like it, it's more effective than uh, either hiring full-time specialists for some, some positions uh, like lawyer, for example, or working with agencies. Investment efficiency. So there is a, uh, there is a, study by JSSN Global Startup Studio Network done in three years ago, uh, which shows that uh, startups created in studios based on more than 200 startups uh, showed higher IRR uh, than traditional startups. And then uh, TVPI is like a multiplicator of uh, how, how much is the valuation of your equity uh, in comparison with amount of money you invested, for example, if you invest, if an investor investor invested five uh, one million dollars, so uh, in some time uh, they can see that they have five point eight million uh, valuation. If they invest in, uh, so this is the sample of the study. So some some uh, studios and some of their startups, more than two hundred. Uh, they showed a uh, bigger IRR uh, and com uh, in comparison with traditional startups. Uh, and also I saw uh, recent research by uh, PitchBook, which uh, compared some TVPI efficiency of investments uh, in uh, startups of accelerators. And uh, it also like can be compared to Y Combinator uh, in terms of TVPI, this might be comparison, maybe not so accurate, but at least like there are some signs that uh, some great studios show consistently great results with their startups. Um, yeah, then reduced risks because usually the studios have some type of uh, playbook or stage gate model when they invest in portions of capital. Uh, so for example, they invest uh, 50k for the first two months then uh, in some time they invest more 100k for the next three months if if a startup uh, uh, does well and if uh, if something is going wrong for example during this stage during this four months they had to get revenue but they don't get this revenue they uh, might decide to pivot the startup or stop it and not invest uh, anymore and uh, use uh, the team for, for other ideas. Uh, and so it is a way to de-risk. It might be difficult to start up founders when they meet some uh, obstacles to decide that, okay, we are going to uh, completely pivot because this idea doesn't work and studios can pivot cold bloodly. So this, this might be a huge advantage. Then uh, entrepreneurs can dedicate more time for the core business tasks, which is like uh, understanding what uh, the market needs, what your customer needs and uh, uh, building the product. But then like to figure out uh, how to set up, uh, I don't know, uh, the main email or how to create some initial agreements between founders or between investors uh, and, and, and the startup and so on. So like incorporation, uh, legal, uh, maybe some marketing, but I, I believe that the value of, of a studio is to help startup uh, reach product market fit faster and with more likelihood uh, 
uh, of reaching product market fit than uh, independent startup. Uh, and also for entrepreneurs, it's a huge advantage to get access to funding and uh, to uh, network because studios usually develop their network of experts, investors, VCs uh, who can invest money and who can also uh, make some pilot projects, partner with corporations, uh, clients, and so on. And for studio founders or studio partners, um, I think that this model can uh, uh, can help to those entrepreneurs who have a lot of different ideas and who want to implement them all. So one way to do it is uh, create your portfolio in parallel uh, and uh, develop develop it in parallel. I think actually that there is some psychological problem for at least for me which is the shining object syndrome. Uh, so like when some idea comes to me, so I think, oh, wow, this is a super idea. I want to launch it. And uh, I'm more inclined to launch a uh, venture studio than, than other entrepreneurs. And of course, there is like ongoing uh, dilemma between uh, whether to focus on one thing and do it extremely great and like don't have any burn all bridges uh, and only one idea, or like doing some in parallel. So there are uh, pros and cons of each approach. Uh, yeah, my vision for how to launch, how to build a great studio uh, consists of several steps. Uh, yeah, I, I have this uh, this on this slide. Let's use Ninja Techniques. This presentation I did something like uh, two months or three months ago. <laughs> And many people already know what I do during my online meetings. And uh, yeah, what I do usually, I stand up and say, hello, how are you? Uh, how how am I able to work 12 hours a week for last month? I do this ninja ninja techniques. Yeah, and usually, uh, yeah, but let, yeah, let me try to do something more. And usually, uh, usually when people see this they smile they like oh wow this is you are memorable so i want this presentation to be memorable this is why i do this um yeah so what are great ways to, to launch a studio um uh, the first uh, you have to answer the question what is the number one problem and the one number one problem is that um the quality of founders defines the success of, of a studio. So uh, if you are not able to attract great founders, uh, if you're attracting only first time entrepreneurs, young people, maybe students, uh, I know some studios who succeed with this. Uh, uh, but uh, more often it is more difficult to build uh, successful companies. And uh, there is much data showing that second time entrepreneurs, uh, they uh, have much more successful rates than the first time founders. Uh, so for example, uh, VCs almost blindly invest in those with previous exits. This is also the reason why uh, it's great when studio founders and partners had previous exits because it's much more easier to attract funding. Uh, they have also like more probability of exiting company and uh, um, like IPO or acquisition um, if they had previous uh, entrepreneurial experience. Uh, then like nearly 80% of unicorns had at least one co-founder with previous find, uh, founding experience. And uh, there is also a study which shows that VCs just generate more returns. Um, an interesting addition to this is that uh, even if VCs generate high returns uh, from investing in uh, second time founders, um one study shows that uh like top tier vc vc firms cannot add additional values to top tier one founders 
So how to understand this? So they compared uh, like there are four categories. Uh, usual VC firms without big name, just invest money, uh, and top tier VC firms with big name. And also like there are founders, just usual founders without previous big exits, and there are like top tier founders with great exits. So what they compare is um, they um, compared like if a great founder, if usual founder goes to usual VC firm, it is good. If usual founder goes to top tier one VC firm, it is hugely beneficial for usual founder because uh, like if they can show, look, A16Z invested in us. Uh, so, and for many investors, it's a signal, oh, wow, big name invest. So this is great company. I will also invest. And so they have more, uh, they have more, so this top tier one VC firm can add value. But for this top tier one uh, founders, they have no difference. Either great VC firm or just usual VC firm invest money in them. And so I think that uh, this is an opportunity gap for venture studios. So uh, it means that if a studio can prove that because of their expertise in specific field, they can uh, add so much value to, to those founders that for them, it's like 1000 X to, to create a unicorn. So it's very compelling uh, to go there. So I think that uh, this is the difference between VC firms, uh, accelerators and venture studios or startup studios. Um, uh, accelerators, VC firms, uh, and venture studios. Um, yeah, I wanted to add something here about about venture studios, about VC firms. Yeah, I, I remember there is also one study uh, showing that VC funds who had a platform platform roles inside, meaning that uh, there are some people in a big VC VC fund. Uh, who helps their startups with marketing, PR, uh, or I don't know, HR functions. So these VC firms generate higher returns. Uh, this study was done by Platform VC community. I mentioned uh, in, in my research, and uh, it also shows that like hands-on support to startups is uh, uh, creating like more likelihood of success of companies. Yeah, uh, then I continue like wh what must be the conditions to make it unreasonable for top tier founders not to join a studio. And the answer is you have a niche focus so that uh, a studio in three years can say we are the best at building such startups in this market. And uh, your North Star question must be like, what is our niche where we are uniquely positioned to launch our studio and to attract the best advisors uh, investors and entrepreneurs in this field uh, to finally create this like network effects a loop where more expertise attracts even more expertise and your startups becoming more successful and uh, uh, it, it makes unreasonable for top tier founders not to join a studio. Of course, if a studio takes maybe 20 or 25%, which is more uh, compelling to second time founders. Uh, niche team, uh, meaning that you try to gather all experts around you. And there is also study which showed that it's founders with three years of niche experience, meaning that previously they created companies in the same uh, field. Uh, they are like 2.17 times more likely to establish a top uh, 0.1% high growth startup. Um, so you you are, I, I believe it's very beneficial to, to become a niche studio and to start with a small focus. Uh, and then you you create a lean approach on your with your startups, meaning that you try to create companies which generate revenue. Maybe it's not the case for uh, biotech and deep tech and some other companies, but mainly 
if you can generate revenue faster, I believe it's the biggest value of, of the studio, uh, find product market fees faster. Then also, uh, and having like positive unit economics, uh, there is a graphic showing that in 2012, for example, um, only 28% of Series A companies got uh, had revenue. But uh, in 2022, 73% of seed, seed companies already had uh, revenue. So this means that focusing on revenue might be easier to attract funding. And Lean Studio meaning that uh, uh, you can use a ge geographic arbitrage with uh, with uh, your inside your studio. For example, I interviewed one uh, African studio uh, who who are doing some uh, tourism startups in their studios, and their customers are uh, from Europe and North America. But at the same time, they are able to have part of their team uh, getting uh, African smaller salaries, and this is this creates some like advantage that you can be more lean uh, studio and studios uh, located in UK, US, Canada, and other uh, uh, economically developed country uh, countries. It's might it might be uh, efficient to have some team uh, somewhere in developing countries uh, to have uh, more efficient development of products. Um, also AI tools, using AI tools, uh, so it's uh, uh, mandatory, uh, how to say, it's necessary now uh, to, uh, to, to, to make all processes faster during launching startups. For example, Michael Mandir shared that they use some AI tools to even for idea generation uh, inside their studio builders. And also uh, the stage gate model, not for startups. Usually there is a stage gate model for startups, but for studios. Yeah, this is a growth of studios worldwide. Uh, still, I believe that uh, there should be developed some standards to make it easier for external investors and founders to join. In terms of uh, technology, Adoption life cycle. There is a book crossing the chasm, uh, and there are five stages of uh, market. I believe that it's uh, for for studios. It's it's still early adopters, and maybe someday studios will uh, go to early majority, uh, when like many VCs will will have ability to invest in 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 studios directly, and in their startups, even if with a bit. Uh, more equity uh, owned by by a studio and where like uh, many people will understand the studio model and uh, more optimism will be about the model and i suggest here like a stage gate uh, model for launching and, and finding the studio to make it short so you have four stages starting with uh, trying to solve uh, the chicken egg problem or the cold start uh, the cold start problem when you have to convince at the same time investors and founders to join and advisors to to start. If you succeed, if you can attract founders uh, good enough, you uh, you attract funding up to two million dollars uh, for two years of operations. And you are uh, launching a holding company of a studio, and you are targeting uh, from two to four companies a year. And if you can show TVPI of, let's say, ideally three plus, three, five or more for your investors that uh, like uh, you started with 2 million capital, now the value of uh, equity in startups of, of owned by a studio is, let's say, not 2 million, but 6 million or 10 million. Uh, it's a good sign to show investors and raise the fund. So usually studios have dual entity models, a holding company plus a fund. And so you're raising the fund for several years, four years. And then you can you have your first exits uh, ideally during those six, seven years. And uh, then you can become an independent studio, launch new funds and invest and create more startups. This is attraction of one studio, Hexa, 
uh, earlier as they were called e-founders. Actually, there is a studio e-founders, but they created an ecosystem consisting of e-founders, uh, logic founders for fintech companies, and three founders for Web3. Uh, so they created three unicorns. Uh, this is the attraction from 2011. Uh, I interviewed also uh, one of the founder uh, um, uh, of, of the studio, Quentin Nickmans. Uh, and uh, yeah, so here is my presentation. If you want to know more, go to check my research. Uh, it will take one hour to read, but it will save you much, much more time to understand all the uh, nuances and the details of Organic Studios. Amazing. Thank you very, very much, Max, for the for the presentation. I'm going to open it up to questions and comments as well. If anyone in the audience want to share a little bit about your own experience and reflections, uh, just raise your hand using the reactions button. And I'm, I'm going to open up. I'm, I'm super curious about cash cow businesses. And like, it seems to me that that could be an ideal strategy for a studio to start by building some sort of cash cow business that can cover some expenses and then focus on other things. But I'm, I'm curious what you've seen in that regard. Um, I think it's a good model. I'm also uh, have experience in uh, creating uh, just bootstrap companies with, without funding and, and having, uh, having some revenue streams to cover your costs. I think it's very healthy approach. Uh, and uh, ideally, if if uh, the sphere of your expertise is is, is uh, uh, where you can create uh, cash cash cow businesses uh, uh, in, in a fast way, so it is it is a great model. Maybe you want to to have some additional. I know that some agencies uh, they have their uh, already like cash flow business, and they start doing some venture. Uh, venture studio model as their part and uh yeah this is this is usually one of the cases of venture studios but main maybe it's uh it's a bit different uh it's a bit different from true venture studio model when they have like a fund they raise the fund and they invest in, in companies but uh, also can be can can be an approach yeah especially I'm, I'm... Hmm, when, when it's very difficult to to fundraise Mm. Yeah, because I'm seeing from a lot of agencies that sort of dream of doing this, but they never can can quite seem to make the to make the jump. Like the agency business keeps on taking priority, and they the side businesses they sort of die or never never take off. Really, at least in the cases I've seen personally. So, yeah, um, because I I think one one of the problem with agencies is. Uh, usually it's very very difficult to focus on one specific area and they pursue many many areas simultaneously so and it's very difficult to for uh, for founders to understand that like joining this studio gives me much higher chances of success uh, so because they cannot be very niche focused Maybe, maybe, but of course they also have advantages like uh, faster development. Usually they know how to create products uh, and it's cheaper than uh, than just going somewhere. Under understood, yeah, makes sense. Um, Davi, over to you. Thanks. And thanks, Max, for the presentation. Super interesting stuff and I'm definitely going to read the report later on. I have two questions. One is regarding um, kind of uh, governance agreement between founders and the venture studio. You mentioned the example of, you know, a business is not going super well and the venture studio has the benefit of basically just saying, let's shut this down and just relocate the talent to other businesses that are doing better and focus the capital on that. Um, I imagine that's not always the case. It really depends on if the venture studio has the power, the governance rights to do that because the founders themselves don't necessarily want to because of their biases and emotional investments there. So what are the kinds of agreements around governance that, that, that you see around that? And, and if, for example, the ones that centralize the governance power and give more power to the venture theorists 
end up being successful because they have that cold-blooded capacity to allocate the very rationally the resources. Mm -hmm. um, first, uh, I want to make an emphasis on um, studios. They 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 want to keep the great talent inside. So even if yeah. founders uh, meet obstacles with some uh, idea or some company, if if uh, the founders are excellent, I think the studio will do everything to keep them and to say them, okay, this doesn't work. Let's let's try another. We we have a backlog of three hundred uh, ideas. Ideas. Uh, this is the first. The second, I think uh, that every studio is different in their uh, relations with founders, and and I think uh, that they usually have some model which founders understand from scratch that for example okay there is like five stages you have to go through all of this uh, and then like get external funding seed funding for example or studio will will invest and in order to to make a studio invest we have to do this and this and this uh, so i cannot uh, give you overview of like what what percentage of studios what terms they have with uh, with founders mm. uh, but, uh, but i think that uh, first like great founders uh, studios don't want to lose them and the second uh, founders understand the terms of of, of the studio from scratch okay yeah and um the second question was around um if you have seen or heard of any examples that are working with um, kind of symbiotic relationships between the different ventures and the and the studio itself, either by, for example, giving uh, shares of the holding company to the different ventures so that not only the holding owns a part of the ventures, but the ventures own a part of the holding as well. And therefore they have this um, interesting incentive alignment and you know, of sharing resources and whatnot, or by even you know giving LP shares to the founders so that they have also this uh, perspective of like collaborating mm -hmm. to the whole and an incentive to stay, as you say, you know retention of talent and collaborating amongst themselves. So if you've seen something like that, or even you know something we've been we've been studying is uh, revenue pooling, right? Like one percent of revenues goes into a shared pot that then gets allocated amongst all the different companies and how that might benefit the probability of success and reduce the probability of failure of the companies. Um, I know that uh, I don't know examples when it's done uh, or like in some um, huge scale, but I know okay. that in the studio I mentioned uh, OSS Ventures doing B2B sales for manufacturing, visit factories 800 times. So I know that like every, uh, every, employee has shares in the in the their studio um yeah. earlier i heard probably i read one example in the book called uh startup studio playbook um uh, and uh, there was one in uh, one studio which was relying only on like the whole studio is owned only by employees and uh um if i understood right its studio doesn't doesn't work now um, but I know some initiatives of startups who, who create some pools of uh, shares of startup founders to de-risk and to give like, yeah. one access to like if we'll have some uh, successes in our community, everyone will uh, get benefit yeah. from. So and to also uh, stimulate like uh, helping each other and uh, collaborating um between between different startups so yeah. i think it, it might work it might work uh maybe you can share i think you 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 know much more examples than me yeah no actually I, i'm i'm looking for examples so that was the focus of my question so if, if any of them come to mind I'm, i'd love to, to hear them but thanks for the presentation mm, okay okay <laughs> okay well, um, let me ask then uh, a little bit about the the parallel the parallel approach uh, and a bit more what you have seen. I think, like you, I'm someone who 
enjoys a lot more having two free projects that I'm focusing on rather than a single one. When I'm focusing on a single one, my energy goes down and essentially I feel I'm a lot less productive that way. Um, but as you mentioned, there is the, the risk of the of going too far the other side. I imagine a, a good studio should have a good balance in between these personality types. Some that like jumping across, others that are a lot more dedicated to, to one track. Um, I... So I wanted to ask you if you if you see or what do you see in respective to uh, let's say contribution. So there is for ex uh, I'm trying to remember the name. I think it was like Consilience Ventures or something like that that launched uh, by uh, a guy who used to lead the acceleration at Microsoft, um, and it was kind of like a more networked uh, startup studio where you would have like essentially all of these freelancers that could contribute across multiple teams or other things like that. I don't know how successful or not. They've been, uh, but yeah, I kind of wanted to ask you a bit more about this area. If you have any any thoughts or interesting examples to share, uh, maybe I didn't understand the question. Uh, like there are two types of people. Even I remember this. Uh, my first million podcast where uh, in one episode there were like they they were discussing this uh, model with uh, startup studio model with Jack Abraham from Atomic, and probably from this episode uh, something like. Shen Puri shared something like, I'm a shining object syndrome person launching many companies simultaneously, and it gives me energy. And uh, Sam said that, uh, like, okay, I think that uh, entrepreneurs should focus on one thing. So, like, there are just two types of people. I also believe that focusing is very beneficial, but, like, if you at least have uh, this... Uh, inclining to launch many companies do it in one niche so like you are a leader uh you are the leader in in this field of your startups uh you are launching maybe maybe you can you can ask some additional questions about this no i i think that that makes sense i'm wondering in the the configuration of the talent within the within the studio like it makes sense to have a few a few specialists uh that are just doing a specialist thing in one startup so you know like a database design specialist you don't need them full-time in any startup ever like until the thing becomes gigantic so it makes sense to have a lot of people like that but um i don't know i guess it's just for me an area i'm trying to wrap my head around of thinking where is a good boundary or in like in which domains does it make more sense to have this sort of free-floating specialist versus uh, allocating just capital to the uh, startups to figure it out themselves uh, versus more dedicated talent. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, maybe um, there is a question here from Andrea that I would also love to know your, your thoughts on this. How niche does a niche need to be? Um, there is a book uh, by Andrew Chan, The Cold Start Problem. And Rishan is a GP of uh, recent Horowitz fund, probably for gaming. Uh, and uh, this book is about network effects. Uh, and uh, uh, somewhere he mentions that like many great things which people use today uh, as like big companies, I don't know, Instagram or something like this, they started earlier as a toy. And so like strange niche things that are just for fun might uh, might finally ended up as a huge, huge company, unicorn or something like this. So, and this is, this is my answer to people who, who say that niche is too small. There is no $1 billion market investors will invest in us because like it's it's very very small but i think that it's much more uh important to answer to the question in what we are the best team in the world or at least in in our region uh then like having big 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 markets but not being the best one there so and usually the strategy for all companies is to become a leader at a small beachhead market uh, and then join adjacent markets uh, with similar segments or similar products. Uh, and it helps you to, to build. But without this, like becoming a leader in some niche, 
it's extremely difficult to uh, to uh, attract great founders and to uh, win over some customers that will understand that okay if you if I want to prioritize this uh, value I have to go to this product so this is this is why I believe that uh, uh, even if it's small uh, might be yeah yeah there is there, there is a book I don't know how to define like how niche does a niche need to be. I know, for example, that there is a book, uh, Discipline Entrepreneurship, consisting of 24 steps uh, from one professor from MIT. Uh, and uh, he said, so this book was written probably something like 11 years ago. And he said that uh, you have to define your market. Ideally, it should be from 5 million to 100 million max, uh, uh, the, the size of, of, of the market. So like your product should uh, should target, total addressable market for your product must be not more than 100 million, not less than 5 million. But it was 10 years ago, now, now might be something like, I don't know, 20, mil, 20 million or 10 million at least or something, but still depending on the market. So I think for the US is, is bigger, for the for other countries it might be less cool. thank you very much we'll definitely check it out uh max we're running out of time so thank you very much again for your presentation and participating today uh thank you all for coming uh -huh.